you hear a general practitioner talking to a patient named Sarah Gleason. For questions 1 to 12, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at your notes. Sarah Gleason, come in, please. Have a seat. Hi, doctor. Thank you. So, what can I help you with today? Well, I'm a little worried because of a couple things, actually. I've been taking a combined oral contraceptive pill called Monofeme to help me, well, for more regular periods. They've been a little crazy the last few months, so the last GP prescribed it for me. The first few weeks, I thought I noticed something, like I just felt different somehow, a little off, but I thought it was just my body getting used to it. But it hasn't been getting any better, so I want to check that out. And the second thing is, well, I'm worried I may be pregnant. Okay. Well, look, let's start with how you've been feeling, and then we'll move on to that, because it would be helpful to establish the symptoms first. Can you describe those for me? Well, the first thing I noticed was these really bad headaches. They kind of spread out all over, but they always start around my right eye, and they just seem to last for hours. I'd take some paracetamol, but nothing would change. I tried drinking more water and just resting in bed. They'd just kind of stay there, and they're like nothing I've ever experienced before. On top of that, I often get really nauseous as well. I've never actually thrown up. I only get the sensation, kind of like motion sickness. Mmm, okay. These symptoms are quite common, actually. Is there anything else? Well, I've definitely put on some weight. I think it's about five kilograms. I just feel really bloated, and I mean, that's a lot to put on in a short time. Until recently, I also noticed some spotting, and it definitely wasn't my period. It just started happening at the oddest and most inconvenient times. But now, well, it's stopped altogether. Okay. That's why I'm really worried, because the truth is I sometimes forget to take the pill. If I forget, I try to take the second one on the same day, like my last doctor told me to do. But, well, a couple weeks ago I forgot three days in a row. And then I started taking the sugar pills by mistake. I just got so confused. Obviously, my partner didn't know, so he didn't use a condom. Then once I remembered, I went to the pharmacy to get the morning after pill, but I think it might have been too late. I almost bought a pregnancy test at the same time, but I was feeling far too nervous then to even take it to the counter. Okay, a blood test can confirm it, although this may take a couple of days to get the results. These days, a home pregnancy test is very accurate, and you'll get the results far sooner but confirmation is needed before making any changes to what you're taking now. Until then, I'd strongly advise using other forms of contraception. Okay, but is it possible to have a urine test here in the clinic now? My friend had one of those, and I think I'd prefer it. Once I leave here, I might chicken out again, and I'd rather just know now. Of course. And also, I think regardless of the results, I should maybe go over all the information about the pill again with you, because I find it all a little confusing. If the result is negative, then I'd like to try again with a different brand and try to be a little more responsible with taking it. Maybe it would be a good idea to make a family appointment too, if you wouldn't mind. I think it would be good to bring my partner along so he can learn all about it too. And if the result is positive, well, it's a good chance to go through everything together. I think that's a great idea on both accounts. I'll start by giving you... You hear a urologist talking to a patient named Mark Jenkins. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at your notes. Hi, come in. It's Mr. Jenkins, right? Yes, Mark's fine. Sure. Now, Mark, you've been referred to me because you're suffering from urinary incontinence. 
Yeah, that's right. And you're 38 years of age? Yes. Okay. Well, I have your GP's letter here, but I'd like you to tell me more about this. How long you've had the symptoms, how it's affecting your life, that type of thing. Sure. Well, it's been going on now for about two months, actually. A little longer, I think. At first, I resisted going to see my doctor. I mean, I'm not that old yet and reasonably fit and healthy. And frankly, I was more than a little embarrassed. A guy my age doesn't usually expect to have the same issues as a man twice my age. But eventually it just became too much for me to take and that's when I sought some advice. Sometimes I could feel it coming, but most of the time it was a sudden burst, so to speak. Okay. Was there a particular trigger? Basically what happened was I'd recently started a class of CrossFit training. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but it's all performed at a high intensity and crosses over various disciplines like weightlifting, rowing, gymnastic type movements, that sort of thing. Well, every time I went to class, I had this really heavy pressure on my bladder. Eventually, right in the middle of weight training, it became so strong that I had no control over it. It just leaked out while I was doing it. Later, I noticed that it'd also come on if I had severe coughing fits. That's understandable. And your doctor did some tests? Yeah, so my GP's a great guy and he was really professional about it. I had a prostate exam, the results of which are apparently fine, and it's a normal size and everything. He also got me to keep what he called a bladder diary for a full day and night, which was fine. I recorded how often I went to the toilet normally, and also the occasions that I didn't have control. I have all that here for you. Right, that's certainly helpful. Look, you're obviously very fit, but could you tell me some more about your health, especially any past conditions, operations, or if you've ever smoked, that kind of thing? Well, up until five years ago, I was quite heavy. I'm only 170 centimeters tall, and I used to weigh 135 kilograms, so that gives you some idea. I think my BMI was 46 or 47, so I was classified as obese. I haven't had any operations, but my GP at the time confirmed that I had pre-diabetes, which really scared me. I was a pack-a-day smoker, but usually more. I was also a heavy dope smoker, and I was in an office job. That's what caused me to overhaul my life, change to a very physical job, and get myself to the gym. What do you do for a living now, then, Mark? I'm a roof tiler. So you can imagine what that's like, being on top of a three-story building and suddenly needing to go. It's not an easy job to begin with, and this is making it 50 times worse. And has that affected your social life at all? Look, if I'm completely honest with you, my bladder seems to be controlling every aspect of my life. I know that sounds like an exaggeration, but that's how it feels to me. I've already lost a relationship over it, so now I'm single. But I'm still young enough to be out dating and all of that. But the fear that this condition has left me with means that I don't really meet friends very often. It's an enormous burden. I was stuck in a line at a bank the other day and had to leave with a very noticeable wet patch on my pants. I'm scared to leave my home. It can be very burdensome, I know. The good thing is you've taken steps to fix it. So what I'll ask you to do now... In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. You hear a registered nurse explaining to a student the uses of a peak flow meter. Now read the question. Dr. Matthews wants us to monitor Lucas Young in bed 6 using a peak flow meter. Are you familiar with this device? I've seen them before, but I thought they were only used in special circumstances. In short-term monitoring, they can be very useful for a number of reasons. For example, if a patient has suspected occupational asthma, the peak flow meter can help diagnose or exclude the possibility of asthma. 
It's also handy in monitoring a patient's response to new medication, or in this case, a change in dose. In most cases that I've witnessed, they're used to calculate the trigger point for a written asthma action plan. I see. You hear an emergency department physician discussing a patient with a colleague. Now read the question. In bed five, we have Jason Burgess, a six-year-old boy with a suspected accidental minimal ingestion of eucalyptus oil. His initial symptoms included mild CNS depression, drowsiness, and ataxia. On admission, his breath smelled very faintly of eucalyptus. At the time of the incident, his mother was in the bathroom where there was an exposed bottle of eucalyptus oil on the vanity. She was distracted only momentarily, but when she looked back, she noticed oil droplets on the front of Jason's shirt as well as on his lower lip and chin. She cleaned his mouth and changed his clothes and thought he was fine, but around an hour later, she noticed his change in demeanor. We need to continue to monitor his vitals and watch for any changes in his current condition. He's appeared more alert over the last hour, so it's looking positive, but we can't be too careful in a case like this. You hear a nurse educator briefing a student nurse about the importance of compression stockings. Now read the question. Compression stockings are specifically designed to apply pressure to the lower legs helping to maintain blood flow and reduce discomfort and swelling. They fit very snugly to help the body's circulation, but that means they can be rather uncomfortable, so not all patients like wearing them. So does that mean all patients have to wear them? Not all, but we encourage their use for post-op patients and especially for particular conditions, such as Mrs. Jones in bed six. Okay, so why is it so important for her? I was told they are very expensive. Mrs. Jones suffers from lymphedema, which is a chronic condition that causes swelling in the body's tissues, but particularly in the arms and legs. Compression stockings can help blood in the veins return to the heart, and a patient's health should never be compromised or impeded by cost-cutting measures. You hear an audiometry nurse talking to her colleague about a recent patient. Now read the question. I just had another patient who works as a bartender and now has noise-induced hearing loss. That's the third one this month. It's very common, but then it's their choice to work in that environment. Of course, but I doubt they go into it with the intention of losing their hearing. Surely the employer should be held accountable. Perhaps, but it's still a personal choice. Yeah, I guess. Plus, they earn more than us with all the tips they get. When was the last time we were given a tip for what we do? You don't expect to get tips, surely? Of course not. I'm just saying they get paid very well for what they do. They don't have to spend money studying, and they still do well for themselves. Yeah, true. But being paid well doesn't justify losing your hearing. I don't know. It seems like a fair trade to me. You hear a nurse giving instructions on subcutaneous injections to a patient. Now read the question. Subcutaneous injections are given with a very small needle that causes little or no discomfort. It's important to find a comfortable, well-lit working place to do the injection. Remember that preparations for each injection are as important as the injection itself. Plan to do your injection at the same time each day. Consistency is key. Make sure it's the medication your doctor prescribed and always check the expiration date on the vial. 
If it is past its expiration date, make sure not to use the medication. The same goes if you see any particles or discoloration. Just take it back and check with your doctor or pharmacist. You should get into the habit of cleaning your work area with soap and water. Dry off the work surface with a clean towel and then begin to assemble your medication, disposable syringe and needle, your alcohol swabs and puncture-proof disposable container. You hear two nurses at a training day discussing a lecture. Now read the question. I can't believe we just wasted 20 minutes listening to a lecture on how to deal with patients with a fear of needles. Didn't you find it helpful? Oh, come on. That entire lecture was aimed towards a student with zero experience. I know what you mean, but I found the tips on how to get them through it quite interesting, actually. Especially from before you begin, like watching their body language or asking them to lie down. I mean, some patients faint before you even touch the skin. Didn't you already know that? You've been nursing for years. It's so obvious. Of course it's obvious, but it's good to hear it, especially knowing I'm not alone in finding my patients with needle phobia difficult to handle. I think I should have gone to the respiratory review on lung sounds. You hear a clinician called Jonathan Cross giving a presentation to a group of healthcare providers. You now have 90 seconds to read the questions. My name's Jonathan Cross, and I'm here today to discuss the somewhat controversial topic of unrestricted visiting hours throughout all departments of a hospital, including ICUs, our intensive care units. Across the globe, in every ICU, regardless of discipline or location, determining appropriate visiting hours is and will likely remain a challenge. Traditionally, physicians, nurses, and other clinical disciplines have behaved as though critical care units are designed for them rather than for patients and their loved ones. It now appears the tide is turning on the part of clinicians to provide enhanced benefits to patients and their families by making more time available for visits. This is seen by many as a positive change, but with any new initiative, there are those who oppose the shift in culture and cling steadfast to more conventional ways. So what are the problems associated with open visiting hours? Without question, liberal or unrestricted visiting hours can be more burdensome for clinicians who work in the ICU, particularly nurses, because of the potential disruption of daily workflow that might result from consistent family presence at the bedside. As most healthcare providers assert, to navigate the bedside of critically ill patients 
without family presence is less cumbersome. It's this that's prompting the naysayers to pose questions like, how will open hours affect the staff? Will it lead to adverse effects on patients or staff? The real question, however, is why open visiting hours causes such concern among critical care personnel. Multiple studies have been done and have repeatedly reported no adverse effects, such as infections or unstable vital signs, or on quality of care, and yet clinicians continue to cite concerns about safety as justification for restricted visiting hours. There was a recent study published in Intensive Care Medicine by Gianni and colleagues who identified the level of burnout among physicians and nurses in eight Italian ICUs prior to and at six and 12 months after liberalizing visiting hours. This study demonstrated two important findings. Firstly, there was a 10% increase in the reported level of burnout at both time periods after visiting hours were opened. This increase was seen predominantly among the nurses. Secondly, despite the increase in the reported levels of burnout, the opinion of the physicians and nurses toward having unrestricted visiting hours remained favorable and essentially unchanged before and after the policy change. This latter finding is an important one and represents a significant shift in attitude. Both physicians and nurses acknowledge the importance of open visiting hours to patients and their families. This suggests that even at the risk of their own discomfort, Providing enhanced benefits by way of additional family time for patients is a priority for clinicians. An important issue that was not covered in the trial is the potential of family burnout. A prolonged presence at the bedside may expose family members to another type of anxiety caused by frequent interruption due to healthcare professionals who may not always prioritize communication with families especially when unexpected deterioration of the patient occurs and rapid life-saving measures have to be taken. Therefore, opening of visiting policies should be accompanied by the implementation of a consistent family support policy, including social work, palliative care, and other counseling services to improve communication with families. While some supposed benefits of open visiting hours are clearly beneficial, such as allowing for families with difficult work schedules to still visit or enhancing shared decision-making about patient care, there are also those that seem to stretch the realm of possibility. One such controversial benefit is facilitating family presence for CPR and procedures, areas traditionally off-limits to family and friends. At such a time as CPR, for instance, it's suggested that witnessing this will in some way improve family outcomes and provide closure, Surely the level of stress during such a time on the parts of both staff and witnesses would be too much and it's during such times that families should be requested to leave. I'd like to state here that open visiting hours does not mean visiting without rules. Family member behavior can be restricted if it is disruptive to the care of the patient or other patients in the ICU and family members can be expected to follow the same rules concerning infection control as ICU clinicians. These are the facts. Administration as well as families must be educated to understand the demand that open visiting hours presents. Clinicians must also continue to be supported. By doing so, we may just usher in a new era in which patient-centered, family-centered, and clinician-centered care can all be one and the same. As clinicians who are loyal to the interests of our patients, we owe it to them to provide them the kind of environment in which critical care and death have occurred for many years outside the hospital, surrounded by the people they care about the most, rather than by strangers. You hear an interview with a midwife called Susan Porter, who's talking about when to cut the umbilical cord. You now have 90 seconds to read the questions.
Today we're talking with midwife Susan Porter about a rather controversial topic. Susan, why is the question of when to cut the umbilical cord of a newborn still so significant? And can you give us a brief history of the subject? Well, you're right in that this question has always been a remarkably controversial topic. And some new research carried out over eight maternity units across the UK indicates there's good reason for never having let it go, as the evidence now seems to suggest that delaying clamping and cutting the cord after birth could improve survival, specifically in babies that are born prematurely. It all started in the 1960s. Shockingly, before that time, women were still regularly having massive bleeding at the time of childbirth and were dying, which then prompted the testing of a new drug, an injection that clamped the womb down within seconds. It was the magic bullet they'd been looking for because it appeared to be very effective at preventing postpartum hemorrhaging. But of course, there were concerns about that, too. Can you tell us more about that? One of the worries was that it worked so well that it would squeeze extra blood into the baby, effectively filling the baby with blood. So they very quickly developed the practice of clamping the umbilical cord only moments after delivery. Obviously, clamping is inevitably necessary, but thinking has changed so much now that it's a little strange to think that even in the 1980s, the only reason for not clamping within a 10-second time frame was if you dropped the clamp and had to go and get another one. In other words, it was immediate. And what happens if we don't clamp a baby's cord? Well, the circulation between the placenta and the baby will continue for a period, And recent research has shown that it probably continues for longer than we'd previously thought. So if you keep the baby at more or less the same level as the mother and just don't touch the cord, that flow will continue. That's how the baby breathes before it's born, so you need a bit of a transition for the baby to start breathing through its own lungs. Particularly if the baby's had a vaginal birth as it's been squeezed in all sorts of ways. And maybe just leaving the baby alone for a few minutes allows it to stabilize its own heart system and also establish its own respiration. It sounds very unscientific, but it's a system that's been designed to work that way, and it's us interfering early that was changing that system. What's the standard waiting time before clamping these days? People typically use either 30 or 60 seconds, which is still fairly quick. I find it amazing that in the age of potentially sending a person to Mars, the best time to clamp still eludes us. In one unit I know of, for preterm babies, they absolutely delay. Healthcare professionals, to this day, still argue about it. The problem is that there have been dozens of previous trials, and they were very poorly executed. The trials all showed it was better to wait, but scientifically, nobody really believed the results. They simply didn't trust them. The UK trials seem to have demonstrated very clearly that for preterm babies, at least, waiting is optimal. The unit I just mentioned now waits two minutes. And what's your take on the benefits? If it reduces the chance of a preterm baby dying, that's the best possible outcome. I think parents understand the logic. I doubt a parent would say they don't want it. They'd say, yes, I can see the benefits of trying this. And especially if it's explained to them that the potential harms of letting the baby go cold are far outweighed by the increased chance of survival. An interesting offshoot of this is the positive change for the mother, as it reduces what was once the norm of mothers having their babies transferred away from them, where the first thing they see is a photograph. Based on what you see, how likely is it that extended times will become universal? In babies that are born early, all the organs are still immature, and that means both its heart and the blood vessels in the brain are not fully developed yet. So one of the big problems is hemorrhagic stroke. Also, they're not ready to start breathing on their own, so just by leaving the cord alone, there is better oxygenated blood in the placenta than there is in the baby. The cord gives them access to this. It's essentially a backup to allow more time for the baby to establish its own respiration. This really can't be denied or disputed any longer. I mean, what are the drawbacks? I think change will be gradual across the board, and in years to come, we'll look back on these days and ask ourselves what took us so long.